From the 1940s onwards, there were two paradigmatic places for the treatment of mental illness. The asylum we've already looked at, but at the other we've only made a passing acquaintance. For this was the therapist's couch, of which Freud's couch remains the psychotherapeutic ground zero. In the USA, especially the USA, the Jewish diaspora fleeing from Nazi persecution, combined with the success of psychotherapy in treating battle fatigue, gave psychoanalysis an incredible momentum which resulted in a virtual takeover of US psychiatry. The reign of psychoanalysis was to last into the 1970s and its star only really fell in the final years of the 20th century. We've already seen of what Freud's theory consisted. Of course, there were splits in the movement, the formation of new schools promoting perspectives that differed in significant ways from that of the master. I'm talking Jungians, Kleinians, Adlerians, Lacanians, to name but a few. But whichever school they happen to be from, their therapeutic method was essentially the same. Analysis, analysis, and more analysis. Constantly driving the patient towards self-understanding, revealing their maladaptations to parents, family, and other people. Exploring the life traumas that had resulted in the production of neuroses. Questioning, probing, leading the analysed, oh so slowly, to the promised land of catharsis. It was not only an excruciatingly slow, but also an expensive process. It could also become a way of life, dangerously so. Talking with Woody Allen, we were, we were sort of segueing into the subject of, uh, what, what is it, 15 years? In, no, 13 years. Thir 13 years in, uh, in classical Freudian psychoanalysis. <clears throat> uh, yes, eight years I was on a couch, and um, five years I was allowed to sit up and face him and, and uh -huh. chat. And, yeah. uh, it helped me, I think. I don't know. How, how do you know, really? That's what I, it's always the big question mark for me, is when do you decide, I'm done? Ah, that's a good point. I don't know if you're ever really done. I know that certain characteristics about me are different now than they were when I started analysis. I'm, yeah. I started when I was uh, 22, and I'm 35. So I have age. <laughs> that's something. <laughs> uh, that is now, it's easy to be horrified by psychosurgery and the shock treatments. Psychoanalysis would, on the face of it, appear to be far less dangerous. But as Roy Porter reveals in his chapter, The Therapeutic God, the therapy could be every bit as threatening to the physical as well as the ontological security of the patient. The danger lay everywhere, not least in the process of transference, where the feelings that the patient had about, say, their mother or father or lover were passed on to the analyst. It's hardly surprising then that sexual relationships formed, relationships that now appear highly exploitative, the psychically vulnerable, in love and having sex with their therapist. It was something that seemed to happen all too often. And then there was the issue of its efficacy. When historians have gone back and looked at the original foundational cases, Anna O, Dora, the Wolfman, invariably these were not the successes that they were touted to be. In fact, the claims that Freud made border upon charlatanry when we consider his lack of therapeutic success in any of these. Porter tells the story, which you should read, of John Ball, a seemingly well-balanced man sucked into analysis and spat out a broken bankrupt an obsessed neurotic. He ended up stabbing his wife repeatedly, violently murdering her. Treated by a behavioural psychiatrist, as Porter describes it, he came to recognise how his couch work had turned him in upon himself, divorced him from reality, infantilised him, and through suggestion, given him a vocabulary of concepts, mother fixation, castration complex, etc., which had completely crippled his mind and emotions. He was made to take responsibility for his choices. All blame could not be laid at the door of psychoanalysis. Ultimately, he recovered and was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Now, this story was designed by Porter as a cynic doke of the malign power of psychiatry to possess the suffering subject. But is it fair? Can the whole project founder upon cases of mistreatment? Two things. 
Firstly, it's quite clear that the relationship between the analyst and the analyzed could be productive. In the case of the poet Anne Sexton, it was her original analyst who encouraged her to write poetry. Out of the therapeutic encounter emerged art, stunning art if you like confessional poetry, which I do. Later, however, a new psychiatrist started an affair with her, which they carried out in his rooms under the nose of his wife, who was the receptionist. Perhaps the reason he charged Sexton for these sessions was for that very reason. This point, that the therapeutic relationship can create as well as destroy, not the affair bit, can be inferred from Mikhail Borsch Jakobsen's Cultural Histories of Psychiatry. The therapist is able to elicit, to create, to construct, to make things that weren't there before. On the good side, art, on the bad, trauma. So, psychoanalysts are producers. Sometimes they produce madness and suffering, and at others, art. Secondly, psychotherapy became increasingly shorn of its psychoanalytic base. Aaron T. Beck's creation of cognitive behaviour therapy in the 1960s was a response to what he perceived to be the failings of the unscientific psychoanalytic model. Taking a neurological approach, he believed that the workings of the brain could be reprogrammed through simple cognitive techniques where errors in thinking, cognitive dissonance if you like, could be corrected by training the patient to think differently. The cognitive dissonances are things we all recognise, like selective abstraction, where you take one small event and give it a significance it doesn't warrant, often amplifying small negatives. It had none of the mystery of the Freudian model. It was quick, it was cheap, and it was thoroughly pragmatic. It sounds very similar to the kind of treatment that Bolt finally received while in prison. It sounds like the ideal therapy for neoliberal capitalism. CBT is very much in vogue now, as is mindfulness. In fact, not a day goes by when there isn't some mindfulness story in the press. The other day about how profitable it is for its practitioners who are much in demand in schools and businesses. Mindfulness's origins lie in Buddhist philosophy. John Kabat-Zinn, a trained physician and a researcher working at the University of Massachusetts Medical School in the late 1970s, was personally interested in Buddhism and saw huge potential in its capacity to reduce stress. He set up a stress reduction clinic at Massachusetts and then developed a course called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, MBSR. Significantly, he very quickly attempted to divorce the system from its Buddhist origins, insisting upon its scientific credentials and its testability in a clinical framework. It shared this strongly with CBT. Now, both are psychotherapies. While they're often used in tandem with drugs, they stand on their own and rely upon the practical ability of the therapist to guide the patient into an enlightened understanding of their predicament. That both insist upon their groundedness in science doesn't necessarily make them any more scientific than Freudianism, or better. As we've already seen, perhaps the most important factor in improving the mental health of individuals is the belief that they are being treated.